Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. The following podcast was recorded on the 18th of March 2013. This week we hear from Patricia Woff and Angela Woods of Durham University, who explore pathologies of the postmodern. Um, it's also a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm scribbling away here because I didn't actually know exactly what Andrew was going to say. <laughs> so I said I would just somehow um, have a loose collection of notes, and then I'd take off. Um, so I'm now going to do that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pick up on some of the things that um, Angela's been talking about, um, I think that that kind of statistic about Frederick Jameson's essay is quite interesting, that that was the most access cited essay of the 1980s um, across the uh, humanities and the social sciences, this essay on postmodernism and the culture of late capitalism. Um, what I'm going to try to say a little bit about, I think, is um, it seems as if postmodernism is now unfashionable. and for a variety of reasons, I think. And I, w I want to think about, have we actually moved out of postmodernism? Are there good and perhaps um, um, sound intellectual reasons for moving on from postmodernism? But is there also a kind of political capital invested in um, suggesting to us that we should dump off postmodernism? Um, so I'm going to talk about, try and address some of these things. Um, I think if Jameson's essay was the kind of height of postmodernism, which was certainly in the 80s, um, and that's when I wrote about postmodernism, really. Um, and what I tried to define as postmodernism at that moment was, in a, in a book that I wrote at the time, was that postmodernism, um, it was hard to define. It, it was everything from, um, you know, Beckettian characters kind of struggling out of dustbins, to John Cage's music, to certain kinds of philosophy, um, to late capitalism, to technology, to the hyperreal. I mean, there were all these kinds of ways of talking about postmodernism. But it seemed to me that it, it consisted largely of, um, first of all, in terms of um, philosophy, a move to anti-foundationalism, that there, were, there was no way we could access the origin of truth, the self. Um, deconstruction was all about inverting the binaries so that instead of God being the source um, of, 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 of the created world, there's a kind of inversion where culture creates God. Um, they're, they're relations of power. So um, male, female, the, the idea of the male is that the idea of the female is created through the idea of the male. So that this, this kind of sense in which there is no foundation to any discourses. The idea that this somehow expresses this culture of late capitalism, it also expresses a mood of uncertainty, and I think a kind of crisis of enlightenment, a sense that all those discourses which had posited foundations for science, for progress, for social justice, for politics, had all run into problems of one kind or another. So there's a kind of catastrophizing aspect to postmodernism, a sense of blocked futurity. Um, OK, if enlightenment's run out of steam, where do we go next? If science has delivered us a whole lot of problems, um, how do we address it? And then an idea that art and culture themselves respond to that condition um, through various strategies of irony, self-reflexivity, parody, etc. So metafiction. Um, you know, fiction that exposes itself as fiction, that suggests the world is itself a fictional construct, sums up this sense of, of the postmodern, that everything is constructed. So there's a huge emphasis on language um, and culture as actually constituting truths. Well, all of this ran into trouble in the 90s, and, the, and there was a kind of interesting event that um, called the Sokal hoax um, towards the end of the 90s which kind of seemed to pinpoint what then became known as the science wars. Um, and in, in the Sokal hoax, um, 
uh, a mathematical physicist, Alan Sokal, published with a, um, a philosopher a spoof article that appeared in a, um, a journal social text where they used they kind of misappropriated and abused all kinds of ideas in mathematics. So they said things like, for example, um, irrational numbers were essentially tied to the feminine. Um, and they made kind of ridiculous statements like this. And <laughs> the, the, unfortunately, the editors of that journal published the essay. And um, the, the <laughs> um, Sokol then exposed it in a, um, an American academic journal called Lingua Franca, and all hell broke loose. Um, so some people, and it really produced this standoff between, on the one hand, um, scientists who said that they, they held the truth, um, most of them writing in a kind of logical positivist tradition um, and affirming positivism, and then accusing postmodernists of relativism and... Um, um, chaos, bringing chaos into the world, um, destroying academic values and academic standards. And that was kind of the moment, I think, when postmodernism then began to kind of um, disperse. Well, I think one of the interesting things about that moment, looking back, is that actually we were going through an, a kind of scientific revolution at the time, but perhaps it couldn't be seen at that moment. Interestingly, most of the people engaged in the science wars were on the one hand physicists and on the other hand postmodern cultural theorists. But in fact, what had, ha what had changed hugely from the period, say, from the two cultures debate between Snow and Leavis in the early 60s, and of course Snow is also uh, a background in um, physics, chemistry, was the rise of the biological sciences. Um, and so, when we get to, by the end of the 90s, which was referred to as the decade of the brain, we seem to be in a wholly new territory. And so people like Steven Pinker wrote books, um, for example, like The Blank Slate, he calls it, where he says postmodernists are um, basically cultural utopianists who think that you can just invent societies because there is no basis to human nature. And what Pinker said in that book was that we now know and he's drawing on the then evolutionary psychology and the burgeoning discipline of uh, neuroscience, we now know that we're wired up in particular kinds of ways. And this is really the beginning of what one might think of as the sort of evolutionary epic, which runs from everything from um, molecular biology through evolutionary psychology to the current neurosciences. And, and it's what Raymond Tallis has recently called Darwinitis and <laughs> neuromania. Well, of course, the crude version of this, and I think the argument of the blank slate is a very crude argument, actually, um, and Stephen Pinker kind of annoys me, so I'll have to say that. <laughs> um, but the argument of the blank slate is really that all these postmodernists have got it wrong, like all the cultural constructionists in the past, and Pinker uses this as an argument to attack the humanities. He says, basically, you know, science has always been the place of knowledge and truth, and that now science has shown that it has to be the place of value as well, that postmodernists have proceeded from a cultural relativism to an epistemological relativism, whereas science now, the science of human nature, which is evolutionary psychology through to neuroscience, is now telling us not only um, how we've evolved, but therefore what our propensities for certain kinds of behavioural activities are, and that these are not culturally constructed, but they're biologically grounded. So I think the challenge to postmodernism came first from this biological turn, if you like, which kind of takes off in the 90s. And that's, of course, the moment where you get genes for this and genes for that, and a, and a kind of popular journalistic discourse of the gene and wiring for this and wiring for that, and that this is going to be the future, and this has displaced um, talk of culture and cultural construction. Um, well, I, I think that we're coming out of that phase. In a sense, you could see that as a kind of backlash against postmodernism. I think we're moving into a new era of, it's been called the biocultural or the eco-social. Um, but I think we're moving into a new era that I'm calling an era of complexity. 
where, in fact, we recognise that most of the world's problems, including those of health, um, are not problems that can be reduced to either biology or culture, but they're actually a sort of um, complex constellation of um, an entanglement of the biological and the cultural, and that neither purely culturalist thinking, like the postmodern, is going to offer solutions to them, but neither is the kind of scientific thinking that grounds itself in mechanistic causality. That in, in other words, we need a new, more complex kind of thinking that thinks of causality um, in terms of the sort of circularity that you get in, in complex system theory, in fact. Um, you know, where causes can be both bottom-up and top-down. So something arises maybe initially out of a biological condition, it proves a set of behaviours, those behaviours then dialectically feed back. And this kind of thinking is starting to appear everywhere, I think. Um, at the time that Pinker's writing, we were going through a moment of neo-Darwinism, where the favourite discourse was the selfish gene. And it was based on um, the sort of biological thinking that was associated with Crick and Watson from the 50s, the famous um, essay that appeared in Nature, with the discovery of DNA in 1953. But Crick said that the central dogma of biology was that the causality is one way. In other words, there's a gene, it carries information, it kind of builds a human being, and there's no way in which what that human being does in the world or the culture it lives in can then feed back and alter the gene. Well, we now know that's not true. We, we're now moving from a neo-Darwinist moment to what we might think of as an epigenetic moment, where instead of um, the kind of Dawkins thinking about the selfish gene, we've moved into an era of um, developmental systems biology, recognizing that the gene um, has a complex dialectical relationship and kind of builds its own environment and then is shaped by that environment. We now know of the brain, it's not simply wired up to produce behaviours, that it operates in terms of what's popularly become known as uh, plasticity, but that it kind of shapes itself and develops in relation to culture. So I think even on these kind of popular levels, these terms that are banded around, like plasticity, we're starting to think in a much more dialectical way and in a much more complex way about the relations between um, the biological and the cultural. And I think what's that, what, what that's produced, in a way, is the sense that we're emerging out of the postmodern and into something that is, instead of where the humanities, instead of simply providing a kind of critique of certain ideas in science, are becoming increasingly entangled with those ideas and vice versa. But I think that it would be wrong to think that we're simply past the post. I think that in all kinds of ways we live in a postmodern culture and that instead of thinking, oh, are we beyond postmodernism? You know, we've gone into this new era of biology or we're moving out into the biocultural, we're thinking about things in entangled terms. Um, but in all sorts of ways, I think we're very much still in postmodernism. And I was thinking that maybe instead of thinking of post, we could think of we're in the re culture. Recovery, reconciliation, reparation, recycling, return, remembrance. Um, and interesting that Ehrenberg talks about this moment as a kind of depressive moment. Because also, you know, if you think in terms of Melanie Klein's notion of the schizophrenic and the depressive, Klein says that the schizophrenic is about splitting and fragmentation. Um, it's how the child comes into the world and constitutes its sense of self, the good and bad breast. And then it moves to a depressive moment where when it recognises itself as whole, it also recognises that the mother, the caretaker, is whole. And then it, it, it's fearful of the fact that it's wounded the caretaker by its excessive demands. And it moves into what Klein calls this reparative phrase, uh, phase, um, which is about... He, she calls it the depressive phase because it's a phase about fearing that you've lost something and trying to retrieve it and trying to recover it and trying to put it back together again. Um, a kind of wounded 
um, a woundedness. And I think that's probably this moment that we're at. We're aware that we've that science has produced all kinds of problems, that medicine's produced iatrogenic diseases, that we've, because of capitalism, we've kind of eroded the environment, we've got all kinds of climate problems and environment problems, we've got collapsing economies right across the world, and so that all these discourses of modernity that postmodernism critiqued in its critique of enlightenment seem finally to have come home to roost in a world that seems beset with all kinds of problems. Well, the interesting thing about that world is I think that most of these problems are, they're not problems that one discipline can solve. They are eco-social or they're biocultural. They involve complex thinking. And probably in the future, university disciplines are going to move more and more, I think, to, uh, to, to overcome um, turf kind of defenses and start to work together to address these issues. But I think, in other ways, we are still in the postmodern. We're certainly not out of capitalism. We're the capitalism or late capitalism that postmodernism identified with all its modes of working has, if anything, intensified. That globalization has brought more and an intensification of the kinds of things that Frederick Jameson was talking about. So if we're thinking of the re, we've now got recession, redevelopment, restructuring, residue, remainder. There's this kind of negative um, sense of the continuation of these kinds of, of problems. I was thinking about Durham's Institute of Risk and Hazard, which has now been named the Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience. Um, that's another re. <laughs> so we're thinking about how can we deal with all of this? Okay, postmodernism um, exposed it, and now we're having to come to terms with it. Um, in the area of health, similarly, I think we're more and more aware that this kind of delivery of biomedicine has created its own problems. That, in fact, increasingly, we're living in a world where health problems are to do with complex lifestyles. Um, the main health problems are stroke, um, heart attack, cancer, but they're not simple biomedical problems that can be cured with a pill. They're about changing how people see themselves, see their world, see their lifestyles. And we're now more and more aware of chronic illnesses that defy any kind of biomedical intervention. And I think at one time that was true for psychiatry, which of course biomedicalized itself with a vengeance in the 70s throughout psychoanalysis. Um, embraced the kind of pharma industry and drugs for depression, drug, drugs for schizophrenia, etc. Um, but I think this is now becoming more and more true of a whole array of chronic illnesses, um, chronic pain, illnesses that seem to defy categorization into either mind or body, and illnesses, in fact, that um, respond much more to this new kind of biocultural or complexity sort of thinking. Um, and in a way, I mean, I suppose what's interesting about this is that I think in a, in a curious way we're going through a moment that's rather like the moment at the beginning of the 20th century, when um, a whole host of new kind of disciplines like neurology, for example, um, were developing. Um, and where there was a culture that was very much thinking about these issues around the relationship between the brain and the mind. And certainly literary modernism is absolutely kind of focused around these issues. Um, you've got on the one hand um, a kind of medical materialism that is trying to argue that um, illnesses like hysteria, for example, were caused by brain lesions or caused by hereditary degeneration, or caused by faulty wiring in the brain. And then you've got psychoanalysis and phenomenology, in fact, early uh, phenomenological psychiatry, trying to challenge that kind of medical reductionism. And I think we're going through another moment like this um, because of these huge developments in the neurosciences, because we can now look at brains, um, you know, on... on um, through electric, electronic scanners, um, and somehow we feel that we've, you know, we're about to solve the problem of um, psychiatric illnesses by understanding the brain. Well, of course we're not. 
So we're kind of in this moment then where I think there's on the one hand a kind of impulse towards um, biological and medical reductionism, and on the other hand this emergence out of the postmodern and into something much more complicated, a, a sort of biocultural and eco-social, etc. Um, one thing I think that perhaps um, has changed is that um, one could say that I think that whereas postmodernism was a kind of an emergent culture when all the great theorists of postmodernism, like Jameson and Lyotard, etc., were talking about it. I'd say that postmodernism is now the dominant culture. That, you know, whereas um, a theorist like Foucault, for example, set out to critique what he saw as the disciplinary society, and he focused on things like the prison, the hospital, the asylum, and talked about how we internalize disciplinary measures and kind of discipline the self. So that postmodernism was very much associated with a liberatory idea of um, fluidity, of flows, um, of fragmenting, etc., to resist this kind of disciplinary modernity. It's clear that the dominant culture now is one of networks, the neo-corporate, the internet, technology, globalization, deregulation. <coughs> The entire culture, if you like, has become postmodern. I mean, we, we're kind of living in a, a dominant of postmodernism. So, what that's done, I think, is to make postmodernism as a critique look somewhat redundant. Um, capitalism has, has basically appropriated postmodernism and it's doing very nicely out of it. Well, actually, it's not, but, <laughs> but it's claiming to. So, I think that, in a way, all those thinkers that were associated with the postmodern moment. I've had to move somewhere else. Um, but I think that to say that we're finished with postmodernism um, is, is not the case. Um, I think it's Giorgio Gambon says somewhere, instead of taking the idea of a paradigm shift in a culture from Kuhn's notion of a kind of scientific epistemology that maps an age, Gambon says, why don't you look at the dominant metaphors, the kind of motifs of an age? So for Foucault, for example, it was the panopticon, this idea of a disciplinary modernity that was regulating us, that was um, placing constraints around us. Um, if we look now, I don't think the panopticon would be our dominant metaphor. I think it would be the network, for example. Networks are everywhere, and everybody's always talking about networks. But increasingly, almost everything I pick up nowadays is, uh, is suggesting that um, dynamic systems theory is the answer to everything, that complexity thinking is there in notions of emergence, is there in notions of autopoiesis. And, and the, the basic um, position of complexity thinking is that we can't understand, we can't begin to grasp a complex field by thinking in terms of mechanistic or linear causal explanations because a complex field is always more than the sum of its parts. So in other words, reductionism won't work if you've got a kind of field of complexity. You think of something like climate change. Um, even on a physical level, it's a complex system. You know, the ice cap melts, um, it's reflecting less light, um, so the uh, temperatures warm up, that melts more ice, and you've got a kind of positive feedback of a complex nature, even at the physical level. And that's even before you've added in carbon burning, industrialization, all of those issues that, that, that involve human actors in this situation. So I think we started to realize that linear mechanistic thinking isn't going to solve most of the problems in the world. It's not going to solve our economic problems. It's not going to solve our climate problems. And these are all, in a sense, problems that are the inheritance or the legacy of modernity. It's what postmodernism started to talk about, but it hadn't kind of moved itself beyond the discourse in a way. Um, and I think this is probably true for health as well. And so I'd say that for po whereas for postmodernism, schizophrenia becomes 
the illness of post, you know, for postmodernism, the way of, and, and I think, you know, Angela's book is brilliant because she just absolutely kind of hits on this. Um, and it's not just Frederick Jameson who uses schizophrenia as a metaphor for, for um, postmodernism. It, 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 it's right the way through its theorization. I don't think there is a single illness anymore. I mean, now Angela mentioned Ehrenberg, which I think is a, is, um, a fascinating argument. I mean, his argument is very much, again, that um, we're in an era where what the postmodern has, has given us is, again, this liberation from modernity as discipline and constraint, and this belief that we can be anything, that we're liberated from all of these constraints and trammels, we can make ourselves. But it's also an era of performance right across the board. You know, in every kind of workplace, there is corporate performance. You know, we've all got to measure up and go beyond whatever um, the previous kind of performance indicators were. We've got to be endlessly creative. We've got to be endlessly flexible. Um, there's a notion of just-in-time capitalism, where you're always adapting to niches, you're always kind of responding to the market. You're always producing a new project, uh, product. And so performativity is not just something that Judith Butler talked about in relation to gender um, or cultural theorists. Performativity is now absolutely central to the kind of capitalism that we're living in. And, of course, what it produces, as Aaron Boak points out, is this huge sense of stress. What if you can't perform all the time? What if you run out of creative energy? And he suggests that depression has become our kind of illness of post-postmodernism, if you like, because there's a kind of weariness. And, it's, and he, he, he says, interestingly, the depression that he's talking about is not depression in terms of a kind of melancholia of the soul. It's a simple slowing down. It's a kind of inability to cope with this kind of constant pressure to become something else. Um, and the f kind of feelings of inadequacy um, and failure that go along if we're not constantly performing in this kind of way. Um, and I know when I look at my students and I look at my own children, actually, and I think, oh, my God, you know, how do they do all those things? And how, they, how are they performing on every front all of the time? Um, and it's just become a kind of expectation of the culture. So I think that when Ehrenberg is talking about depression, he's not using it as a metaphor, actually. It's kind of both a reality and a metaphor. But he's talking about psychometer slowing down and this sense of a sort of resistance to this performance culture that's being played out in what's become the major psychiatric illness across the globe and one of the most common illnesses, um, you know, across physical and um, the mental divide. Um, okay, so, so I think that what's really emerging out of all of this is that um, these oppositions between a sort of culturalist discourse that's talking about language or talking about narrative and a physicalist discourse that's talking about the body, that's talking about biomedicine, that's talking about science can no longer be kind of separated from each other. That so many of the problems that are confronting us, in fact, are going to involve convergence of thinking um, that is producing these new hybrids that people have called the biocultural, uh, the eco-social, etc. But it's entangled. It's a kind of entanglement rather than critique. I mean, postmodern theory was, it was essentially um, thinking as critique. It was challenging <coughs> ideas about science, challenging ideas about truth, challenging ideas about foundationalism, and we now seem to be moving to this, um, much, this sense of, of entanglement. <coughs> so when we think of health, we tend not to, um, you know, if we think of something like stroke, we think about behaviours such as smoking, such as lifestyles, such as diet, adverts, images, all of these things, as well as the actual physical processes that are going on in a body. And Bruno Latour in 2004, um, he said we basically need to move from an idea of critique to an idea of entanglement, if we're going to think our way around this. And he calls it assemblages. He says that um, illnesses have become 
assemblages. If you take something like AIDS, it's not just the HIV virus, it's about homophobia. It's about what kind of research is funded. It's about certain kinds of lifestyles and behaviours and choices that we make. So we're coming to think of health as well as all these other issues in this much more complex kind of way. Well, of course, Tallis says, Tallis, Raymond Tallis has argued um, that, you know, actually what we're looking for are quick fixes. You know, we look to neuroscience, it's going to solve the problems of um, mental illness by identifying genes and then talking about how the brain is wired by discovering lesions, etc. Um, and all of this he sees as coming out of what he calls Darwinitis, this kind of obsession with um, the evolutionary epic. Um, but I, I think that, um, I actually think that although in some ways Talis has some valid arguments, that we've already started moving out of that, that we're actually thinking in these much more complex ways. And I think someone like Ian Hacking is a really important philosopher because he was one of the first. Um, I mean, Hacking's written very sophisticatedly about the idea of social constructionism. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a book I love called, and I know Angela does too, called Mad Travellers, um, about an outbreak of fugue in late 19th century France, where all these clerks suddenly went into fugue states and were found hundreds of miles away, not knowing how they'd got, you know, travelled away from their, their houses and their families and all the rest of it. Um, and... Um, Hacking says, why did this happen? Why was there this outbreak of fugue at this particular moment? And he kind of analyzes it by suggesting there were kind of vectors in that particular society. There was a sort of ideal of aristocratic travel, and there was a fear of the vagrant. And somehow or other, these clerks whose lives were boring, who were trapped in offices with no kind of um, future, um, you know, start to produce these odd symptoms where they, they, they um, move into these fugue-like states and kind of take off and travel. Um, and he suggests that in some ways you can see that as a culturally produced illness, but of a very complex kind. Um, and it's a way in which um, they are expressing a kind of sense of malaise that's very much grounded in, in, in their own um, cultural moment. And I think that um, we've become fascinated by these kinds of illnesses that seem between the mental and the physical. Um, illnesses like Tourette's. I mean, Tourette's is fascinating because we've all had moments where we'd like to just um, launch a load of obscenities um, and have the kind of freedom to do that. And Tourette seems to fall somewhere between, again, the mental and the physical. Is it intentional? Is the will involved? Or is it completely unintentional? ADHD is another illness that, that, that falls into this kind of area. Um, philosophers are fascinated by Capgras syndrome, which is um, a syndrome where um, people s suddenly see a loved one as, as um, having been supplanted by an alien. Um, there's a film, uh, what's it called? The Stepford Wives, if anyone's seen that film. <laughs> and again, I mean, the... the you know, there's an, the, um, some psychiatrists argue that it's a neurological disorder about a failure of connection in the brain between the areas that recognise faces and the area that deals with affect, like the amygdala. But it's another illness that seems to fall between the kind of mental and the physical. It, it's some problem of, you know, they think that people um, with Capgras... Um, syndrome, recognise um, their loved ones, but don't have the accompanying feeling of familiarity, of recognition. And therefore, what the mind does is confabulate a kind of alien, um, an imposter who's been supplanted for the actual loved one. Um, so we've got a kind of fascination, I think, with this kind of murky area. Um, and what we clearly seem to be going through is a moment where all those Cartesian assumptions have been confounded, but where we're not happy either with a kind of medical materialization that would turn everything into a purely mechanical, causal um, 
process that's simply located in a physicalist body. And, 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 th and this is, th these seem to be the kinds of things we're um, grappling with. And I think that, I mean, my own field is actually English literature, so I mainly teach um, literary texts. And I'm interested at the moment in how this has affected the kinds of fiction that's being written, for example. Um, I mean, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, at the high moment of postmodernism, you know, t the, the, the postmodern novel or the metafictional novel was kind of obsessed with versions of language games. That, that um, the idea of metafiction being that the novel is a kind of construct of words and in some ways seems to tell us something about the world we're living in as a construct of words. Um, there's lots of play with um, paradoxes of self-reference in writers like Borges or Nabokov, and those all went along with that high moment of postmodernism, the obsession with language, with narrative, with the linguistic turn. But if you look at the novel now, it's also gone through this kind of affective, phenomenological turn, if you like. And our writers now write about depression, Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections is a kind of brilliant study of um, anxiety, depression, its attempted medicalisation, the consequences of that attempted medicalisation and how we internalise it. But what he tries to do is to use the prose to actually offer you a sort of phenomenological experience. Um, I mean, he kind of maps the sense of depression, it's not people saying they're feeling depressed, they're actually experiencing a world that's flattened, that's emptied out, that's evacuated. And, and when you read the opening of that novel, um, the elderly couple at the centre of it um, are described in their family house, and there's kind of alarm bells ringing, and you, you realise that the alarm bells are a kind of, he calls it a sort of meta sound, it's the sound of anxiety that's running through their lives and can no longer be... Um, you, they can no longer detect whether it's inside their heads or outside in, 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 the, in the world. That, and that's the interesting thing about affect that these writers, I think, have got hold of, that feeling is not necessarily felt. And it was Sartre, I think, who really first wrote about this. Um, feeling is not necessarily felt in the body, Feeling is mapped onto the world. So if we're depressed, we might not think, I'm depressed. Or we might not have a sense that we're depressed. But the world seems grey, seems flattened, seems emptied out. And novelists are very good at kind of constructing worlds that seem to carry that sort of feeling, tone or mood. Um, Stuart, uh, Stuart Sim, um, Jonathan Coe's recent novel... Um, whose title's gone out of my head? The Private Tragedy of Maxwell Sim? Anyway, it's his last novel. It's about a, a, de a depressed kind of insurance salesman who starts hearing voices, in fact, but whose world is, is this kind of neo-corporate world of mobile phones, of internet connections, of depersonalisation, of derealisation. Um, and in the end, he falls in love with his sat-nav. Um, and develops a relationship with it. So it's treated comically. Ishiguro's novels, I think, are brilliant on, on evoking this kind of um, affectless experience of the world. Never Let Me Go, which is a novel about the commodification of the body. The body is a kind of bag of organs if we take the medical materialist view of it. Um, but it's mapped out onto the landscape. It's, it's delivered in the tone of the narrator. And there's a very moving passage at the end where um, the narrator who's just lost her closest friend um, because his organs have been donated. That's the um, phrase that's used. Where they're actually being forcibly removed um, to, to be given to, um, to, to the affluent. Um, she looks at a fence and sees sort of rubbish piled up on the fence. And all the way through, the clones who've, who've been bred for their organs have associated themselves with rubbish. They, they're kind of... They're, they're the 
they're the dregs of society, they're not authentic selves. And this is this moment where she kind of, again, has this moment of recognition as, as she sees all the rubbish blown up on the fence after Tommy's death and recognises something about herself. And one could go on and on, I think, um, um, giving examples of writers who have moved. I mean, Hilary Mantel is another writer, I think, who at the moment... Um, is obviously winning every prize going. Um, but she's a writer who's brilliant at evoking that kind of relation to the world. I mean, my, my personal favourite of Hilary Mantel's novels is one called Beyond Black, which is about... It's a trauma novel um, about a kind of dissociated narrator who um, has been raped continuously as a child and has dissociated from the experience and becomes a medium... Um, and then um, the voices of these kind of abusers speak through her. But her moment of recognition comes when she's watching a bulldozer force its way through Earth. Um, and it's clear that in that moment, she identifies her body with this Earth that's being churned up and destroyed and violated and all the kind of insects and birds uh, are being mangled inside it. And I think... Where literature is important in all of this is that the inarticulable is articulated in that moment. And actually, I think that's how our relation to the world works, that we don't always make knowledge explicit, that we mostly operate at a level of the pre-reflective, where we kind of map our moods onto the world. We kind of suddenly identify um, with a random experience that, that maybe gives us a sudden insight into a way in which we're feeling. Um, and I feel that the mood of fiction certainly has moved away from the slightly manic quality of the postmodern. I mean, postmodern novels were also very good at critiquing capitalism. Don DeLillo, uh, Brett Easton Ellis, etc. But there's something kind of... Um, they're... they're um, obsessed with addictions, with manic, manic uh, with the manic, um, with this world that's running out of control. And I feel that the mood at the moment in art and in fiction <coughs> is a kind of quieter one. It has indeed returned to this question of affect, of the body, of the phenomenological. And I think we've realised that if postmodernism was a kind of linguistic or narrative turn, not everything about our lives can be captured in language or captured in narrative. And that one of the reasons we go to art, you know, whether it's music or whether it's fiction or whether it's film, is that it, it has ways of articulating the articulable that, that can't be put into um, the terms of the explicit. Um, and so, again, I think... There's a sense in which if, if postmodernism made us aware of language and how language constitutes the real, we're now realising that that's not all there is to um, our experience in the world. But equally, I think, you know, we haven't lost, um, we haven't lost the lessons of postmodernism. And I think we could be good postmodernists when we look at the new DSM-5, which now has 500 syndromes. Um, that have become increasingly absurd. <laughs> um, well, you know, where, and that's, a, that's an example of um, you know, the, this cataloguing and naming and dissecting aspect of modernity um, is indeed a kind of illness and a disease in itself. Um, and that the, the, the makers of the DSM are clearly themselves suffering from um, all the kinds of illnesses that they um, try to constitute um, wi wi within its uh, pages. But I think, again, that's, that's, that's part of the problem that, of psychiatry at the moment, that um, in an era that has been dominated by the biomedical and by physicalist accounts of illness, psychiatry was always lagging behind. Um, and it tried to kind of medicalise itself first of all through drugs, increasingly through neuroscience. Um, and what it's producing is this kind of absurdity of inventing endless categories and syndromes um, to try to seem as if it's describing something that is actually out there. And so I think 
that's where the postmodern critique is still extremely useful to show that what's going on here is a kind of language game, um, a sort of scientism, a sort of pseudoscience. Um, okay, I, b I better finish there because I've probably talked for too long. Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dunn City, who host the events. <laughs>